Hello everyone, this is David back uh, with an update on the COVID-19 vaccines. Following a, a video we put out in December, there were a lot of questions and comments uh, received which we thought it was worthwhile to respond to and give an update uh, and make things a little bit more visual and therefore we have a PowerPoint presentation. I do want to point out at the start that there is quite a bit of scientific medical content in the first part of the talk, but the kind of questions that are being asked means that I think we need to go a little bit into the science and the medicines of the vaccines. And my objective is simply to allay fears and point us ultimately uh, to the only way out of the present harsh situation that we're all enduring and that is vaccination. So let's get into the presentation. So a few principles about vaccination. Vaccination is clearly one of the major success stories of modern medicine, uh, greatly reducing the incidence of infectious diseases such as measles and eradicating others such as smallpox. And there are different approaches to vaccine development, which we're going to review in relation to the COVID-19 vaccines. There are three major types of vaccines currently involved with COVID. The first is nucleic acid vaccines or RNA vaccines. And the Pfizer-BioNTech and Moderna vaccines belong to this group uh, and these are um, vaccines which have been approved in the United Kingdom. And then secondly there are viral vector vaccines. The best example so far is the Oxford University AstraZeneca vaccine uh, but following on behind there are other vaccines from other uh, companies. And then thirdly there are the protein subunit vaccines, a little bit behind in the development process, but we may hear of those uh, in the next few months. Let's look at the three vaccines then, which have been approved so far in the UK. The first was the Pfizer-BioNTech. Again, I just point out this is an RNA vaccine, two doses separated initially the uh, designation was by three to four weeks and now it's up to 12 weeks with an effectiveness of around 95 percent a slight downside is the storage it's uh, minus 70 degrees and a relatively high cost per dose the next rna vaccine the moderna vaccine which was authorized last week by the mhra in the uk Again, two doses, 95% effectiveness. Storage is slightly less harsh. It's minus 20 degrees and it can be stored up to six months. But again, a high cost per dose of 25 pounds. The Oxford University AstraZeneca, this is a viral vector vaccine, two doses. We've had different efficacy figures around 62 to 90%, but the latest data is uh, to the top end of that towards 90% effectiveness. And it can be stored in the fridge, as you know, and the unit cost is very much less than the other two vaccines. So these are the three vaccines which are currently approved in the United Kingdom. So let's go a little bit into the RNA vaccines because this will help to address some of the questions that have been asked. And with the RNA vaccines, the scientists take a part of the virus's genetic code and make it into a vaccine that can be injected into the patient. So if we see here, if I just point out, this is just a part of the uh, viral genetic code, uh, the RNA, which is encapsulated in a lipid membrane or a fat-like membrane. And this can then be injected into the patient and this is normally in the upper arm. Sorry about that. So just summarizing, I'm gonna summarize at various stages as we go through, just so that we're clear. You have a small fragment of material from the virus that causes COVID-19, 
which then gives our cells instructions for how to make a key protein that is unique to the virus. And the vaccine will enter into the cells once it's injected, and it tells them to produce the coronavirus spike protein. We've all seen this in pictures on the television, on the news. The spike protein being important to attach to get into cells to replicate and produce the, uh, the, the, the COVID-19 virus within the body. Uh, and so the body's immune system reacts to what it's seeing and produces antibodies and activates some white blood cells called T cells to destroy the cells with the spike protein. So this, if the patient later catches the coronavirus, then the antibodies and these T cells are triggered to fight the virus that it is seeing entering into the body. So that's really important. So again, let's just summarize. Our bodies will recognize the protein. It should not be there. And we'll make antibodies that will remember how to fight the COV-2 virus, the COVID virus, if we are infected in the future. So that's the basis of an RNA vaccine. Now, let's be clear, these vaccines are not made with the coronavirus, and so they are non-infectious. And the RNA, which is encapsulated in that lipid membrane, which is injected, does not integrate itself into the host genetic material, into the host genome, and the RNA strand actually in the vaccine is degraded once the protein is made. So let's have the facts about the RNA vaccines and dispel the social media myths. These vaccines cannot give someone COVID-19. mRNA vaccines do not use the live virus that causes COVID-19. And they do not, secondly, affect or interact with our DNA in any way. The RNA in the vaccine never enters into the nucleus of the cell, which is where our DNA, the genetic material, is kept, which gives instructions that makes us us. And the cell breaks down and gets rid of the mRNA from the vaccine soon after it is finished using the instructions. So these are important facts about the RNA vaccine. But what about the Oxford AZ vaccine? How does this, a vector vaccine, work? Now, in this case, scientists take genes for the spike protein on the surface of the coronavirus and put this genetic information into another harmless virus to make a vaccine. And it's this that is injected into the patient. So it's a different way of making the vaccine. So summarizing, what we've got is a weakened version of a different, different to the COVID, a different live virus. In this case, it is an adenovirus or a cold producing virus. But the genetic instructions from the COVID or COV2 virus is inserted into this adenovirus. Hence, it is called a viral vector. And the vaccine again enters the cells, which then start to produce the spike protein, this important protein, which is what is used in the attachment to our cells if we ever get infected with COVID-19. And the body's immune system reacts, produces the antibodies, uh, and also produces the T cells, which will destroy um, other cells. So in summary, once the viral vector, the adenovirus, is inside our cells, the genetic material gives instructions to make the protein which is unique to the COV2 virus. And copies of this protein prompts our bodies to develop the T lymphocytes, the white blood cells, and the antibodies that will remember how to fight the COV2 COVID virus if we are infected in the future. So these are two different mechanisms producing the same end result. So here is a bottle of the Oxford AZ vaccine. 
And you may see if you go and have that vaccination on the bottle, it's got CHADOX1. What does that mean? Well, the CH actually means chimpanzee because this is a virus. Um, uh, the virus being, being used is an adenovirus, hence the AD that you can see here, and the CH here, and OX here. So it's from chimpanzee adenovirus, which the Oxford team have been using. So it's made from a virus which is weak, a very weakened version of a common cold virus, an adenovirus, which was isolated from chimpanzees. But it's impossible for this virus to replicate in humans. So vaccinating with this Oxford AZ vaccine makes the body recognize and develop an immune response to the spike protein. I think it's important to point out because people say, well, what about the speed of development of these vaccines? Absolutely, the speed has been phenomenal. In traditional vaccine development, we can normally say that the whole discovery, um, preclinical stage, determining the likely clinical dose and developing our manufacturing capability can take three years, maybe even up to eight years. And then the whole clinical trial process can take two years. In some cases, it's been much, much longer than that. And the regulatory review going through the regulatory process would, can often take one or two years. And clearly everything, because of the vastness of the uh, pandemic and the number of people who've been working in this field, everything has been truncated. And so to date, we've had approval of three vaccines by the MHRA, but in the pipeline behind, there are a number of other vaccines. So in late stage development, there are 15 other vaccines. Uh, and earlier than that, there are many other vaccines, about 120 or so other vaccines also uh, in development. So this raises a lot of questions. And these are the questions that I now want to turn to. And there are five of them. Question number one, but is it safe? And what are the risks? Now, please remember, and we touched on this in the last uh, cast that we did, no medication that we take is absolutely safe. And that applies to paracetamol, to aspirin, whether you're on blood pressure medication, whether you're on uh, diabetes treatment, whether you're taking uh, medication for, for, for other conditions. So no medication is absolutely safe. It's all about risk and benefit. And in the vaccine trials to date, there have been a very, very few examples of an allergic reaction to something in the vaccine. So if there has been a bad aller allergic reaction <clears throat> to a previous vaccine, such as a flu vaccine, then clearly this needs to be discussed with the doctor. But it's normally an allergic reaction. So not if someone in the past has had a flu vaccine and just felt a bit fluey, that is not an allergic reaction. And an allergic reaction normally comes within uh, 15, 20 minutes or 30 minutes to something within the um, actual vaccine that is being taken. So that's an important consideration. There are no restrictions, please note, to having the vaccine based on current medications that you may be taking. So some of us are taking a number of medications, but there are no restrictions to having the vaccine based on current medications. The evidence to date says that vaccines are safe. What is not safe is contracting COVID-19, as we know, looking at the death rate, which is quite an alarming figure currently. Question number two. COVID-19 vaccines and the use of fetal cells. Now, historically, vaccines such as the flu vaccine and hepatitis B were developed using non-human cells or chicken eggs. In fact, in Speak in Liverpool, there was a, a, a very large vaccine um, plant for developing vaccines which, um, which use chicken eggs. However, it is clear that human cells are especially useful for vaccine development and for the rapid development of vaccines. And so some cells used in vaccine development today are grown in the laboratory and were originally developed from tissue from an abortion in 1973. And this for some people clearly, uh, for some of us will, will raise alarms. 
And the cells are known as HEC293 cells. However, I really do want us to note that these cells have been replicated and cloned over the past 47 years so that they are a very, very distant remote descendant of the original cells that were isolated. And vaccine research today does not use fetal cells taken from any material which has been isolated recently. The cells used all go back to this cell originally isolated in 1973. Now, the Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna vaccines use the HEC293 cells in just one step in the process, and that is to confirm that the RNA was properly coding, giving the message to make the spike protein um, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Whereas the Oxford AZ vaccine has used the HEC293 cells as miniature factories to generate the vector, the adenovirus, to produce more and more of the adenovirus. So there's a slightly different way, uh, and the Oxford AZ vaccine, yes, has used the HEC293 cells in one sense to a greater degree than the Pfizer BioNTech. But it's really important to note that the HEC293 cells have been used in the development and production of other vaccines in the past including hepatitis A, rubella, chickenpox, and rabies. And so it is not something which is new just to COVID. It's not something which has just recently been introduced. And also, I think it's important to note that the HEC293 cells have also been used in the development of many drugs. And probably we don't know um, which drugs have actually used that development process very readily. No vaccine contains any fetal cell material. That is impossible. No cells of any kind are present in the final vaccine. So I really think that as we think this through, yes, we certainly could wish that fetal cells had not been used and were not used, but we need to consider the greater good argument as well that many lives will be saved with the vaccines that have been generated versus how the vaccine was developed. And I think we also need to remember that as a Christian, we face moral dilemmas every day. For example, the taxes that I pay will often be used for purposes that I totally disagree with. And yet, as Jesus said, we give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And that is important that we obey the authorities and it, it is a dilemma that we have to think through, and it may be a good discussion point for a group uh, within your church setting. Question number three, is it possible that mRNA vaccines will change human DNA? This is something which is common on social media uh, at the present time. And the answer is unequivocally no. The RNA in these vaccines has been synthesized in the laboratory, and after immuniza immunization, the molecules as we've said, enters the cells within the body, gives the instruction for those cells to produce the spike protein for the coronavirus. And this causes the body's natural defense mechanisms to generate antibodies and immune cells against the spike protein. And that is how you get immunity. But it is not possible that the vaccine uh, will change human DNA. Finally, the RNA molecules themselves only survive, as we've said, in the body for a matter of hours following vaccination, and then they are destroyed. There is no scientific or biological plausibility that the mRNA, the messenger RNA molecules, are capable of changing human DNA. I think it's really important to make that point because this is something which is constantly being said that you're going to alter the DNA and this is uh, you're changing the, the, the whole human um, cell makeup. Now, there is a completely different class of viruses called retroviruses, example being HIV, which I've worked on for many, many years, which actually do carry the ability to integrate into human DNA. And that's one reason that it has proved so difficult to generate a vaccine against HIV and work has been done on that for at least 20 or so years 
and billions of dollars have been put into looking for a, a vaccine against HIV, and that has not been possible. Whereas with COVID, we have had the ability to do that, and it's because of the different mechanism um, of uh, cell activation, etc. The fourth question is, well, what is the attitude to COVID-19 vaccines? I hear that many people are resistant to the vaccines. And, and there is a degree of truth in that, that uh, an online survey was done, a large online survey was done in October 2020 with nearly 20,000 people interviewed with the question, if a vaccine for COVID-19 were available, would you get it? And the worldwide response was about three quarters of people said yes. Now it's a complicated figure. So if we look across here, 33% of the total said strongly, yes, 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 I want the vaccine. 40% said yes. 17% said they weren't sure. There were questions, they weren't sure about the vaccine. And 10% said absolutely no. Uh, if we look at the UK, slightly higher overall figure, 79%, and only 8% of people in the UK currently are saying no, they would not take the vaccine, although 13% are saying they need to think about it. So yes, the attitude to the COVID-19 vaccines does vary. And this is understandable because of um, the information that we get and natural reticence to, to some extent um, about some things and also social media having a large part to play in uh, some of the uh, dissemination of untruths. And then finally, what about access to vaccines and profit for companies? People have raised that question. Really important questions as well. And I think government and other agencies and groupings certainly need to apply pressure that we do ensure equitable access. It's not just that we need the vaccines for the UK and Europe and the United States. If we're gonna have any return to normal, normality, then vaccines need to be rolled out across the world to lower um, and middle income countries and the pricing absolutely needs to reflect the urgency of the situation. We can't have a situation where these vaccines are priced so that people can aff can't afford to get it. I have some final thoughts um, on this rather long presentation. I think we need to give thanks to God for the scientific and medical knowledge and the expertise to develop vaccines so rapidly, which will be the key to the ending of this pandemic. Vaccination is clearly an important way to protect the most vulnerable in our community. Remember the words of James, James 1.27, that we are to look after those in distress. And there are many in distress due to COVID-19 and vaccination will look after those in distress. And then God has given us a mind and we must use our minds to think these things through and not just take sound bites that we might hear, which are negative sound bites. We have to think it through and where possible, really do our part to see a degree of normality return. And if this means hard decisions, then we have to make those hard decisions. And finally, we need to take the words of the Apostle Paul to heart. Remember in 1 Timothy 2 verse 1, I urge then that prayers and intercessions be made for all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives. And we need to apply this to those in authority in the country who have to make such difficult decisions. Well, I hope this has been helpful in some way uh, to you. And um, if there are questions, then please, by all means, uh, contact me. So thanks very much indeed.